meeting to respond. Thank you, Ollie. We've um, allocated time at the end of this meeting to respond to questions received in advance from members of the public. Um, we have a number of members um, who are signed up to attend. I think not all are already in, but we had uh, eight signed up to attend. We've not received any questions in advance of the meeting. The only other thing to say this afternoon is that various members, um, I think, have reported during the course of the day some difficulties with Wi-Fi. So um, whilst we would normally all have our cameras on at all times, if you are having difficulties with Wi-Fi, please do turn cameras off and um, that's entirely understandable. Um, and in the event that it's my Wi-Fi, uh, one of my colleagues will step in, uh, step into the brief. Uh, we will continue. Um, our conflicts of interest register um, and uh, you will see that in the pack. And do I have any declarations of interest relating to today, today's agenda? I'm not seeing any hands up. Our minutes of the last meeting on the 20th of September and matters arising. Any comments, questions, amendments, omissions? Again, I'll take those as accepted. Thank you very much. Um, let's move then to Fiona Edwards' report. Thank you, Fiona. Hello, good after ev afternoon, everyone. I'm Fiona Edwards, the Chief Executive of the Integrated Care Board. Um, just to reflect, really, we're in um, we're heading into winter now in, in the autumn months, so that we. Uh, as we've reported before, uh, and we'll cover off in our performance update in the uh, other part of the agenda, we are um, exper experiencing across health and care significant pressures going into winter and also foreseeing that those uh, pressures and demand will rise um, uh, so that uh, we are working uh, collectively to address those. We also, we're also seeing COVID on the increase uh, with increasing pressure through primary care and admission into hospitals. And so um, in order to address that, we've got the strength of our whole system working. So we have our vaccination program up and running. Members of the public will, um, if they're over 50, will already be receiving their invitations to come for boosters. Um, and we're working on... Uh, developing uh, or putting up and spreading um, uh, services to and virtual support to uh, prevent people needing hospital treatment as much as possible, as well as managing uh, flow and through partnership working with our social care partners. And, and the great thing is we are all committed um, as an integrated care board and with our partners to doing the absolute best that we can for our residents and patients to minimise the risks of uh, winter uh, and also the fact that um, people, many of our residents may struggle to heat their homes and that will affect their health as well. So just be assured we are um, working incredibly hard to develop clear actions and we will be launching um, communications and engagement to support that work with the public over the next few weeks because uh, winter is upon us just as the cold weather um, is here with us today and I think I'll just leave it at that for the, for the purposes of this short meeting. Thank you very much Fiona. Um, any comments and questions from the board before we start into the agenda? Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have a number of really um, important uh, agenda items to cover off. We're starting, we've, we have said consistently that we are a data-driven, data-led, data-based system. And it's important to us to understand before we decide, plan, do. And so um, our first um, agenda item in this section is digital and analytics update. And Sam Burrows, you're taking us into that, Sam. Thank you very much. 
Priya, um, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, Oli, I think, is going to share these slides for presentation so that we've got something for you to look at whilst I speak. Um, this was circulated in advance and it was uploaded to the website last week. So I won't, I will avoid falling into reading every page, every word and every page, because my expectation is people have read it already, but it would be good to pull out some key points for you. So um, as Priya says, um, digital innovation is, is absolutely a key priority for our ICS, um, not because digital is cool or interesting, I mean, it, it is those things, um, but actually more accurately, it helps us to deliver the services and the levels of care um, to our residents um, that we know they expect. And it allows us to do that in a fundamentally uh, different and better way um, to help us overcome some of the challenges which we are all facing currently in delivering services. We've been at this for a really long time. This is not something which the Frimley system has picked up um, in recent years. Um, since 2015, we've been working with health and care partners in this geography and more broadly with colleagues in um, Berkshire West as well, uh, with local authorities and healthcare providers and commissioners in that geography too, um, to help better underpin our transformation. Um, there's four kind of key tenets to this presentation, which I'll touch on briefly in each um, to give you a fuller um, update in terms of what we're doing in this space. Um, they're around our shared care record, and our remote management capabilities, um, our resident facing digital services, our primary care transformation and our analytics, which we often describe through the lens of connected care. Um, I'm also going to pick up at the end on four areas of risk for us to note on um, and things which might be helpful for the board um, to reflect on through discussion. So Ollie, if I could have the next slide, please, and we'll go through this relatively rapidly. Um, and the next one beyond that, please, Ollie. Thank you. So um, the shared care record, for those of you who are less familiar with it, um, is a Berkshire-wide data architecture, which enables our care professionals to deliver um, and share clinical data between them in the delivery of services to patients and to residents. It is a technically fiendish task um, to actually deliver in the real world, um, given that we have a plurality of organisations working across the public sector in this space who each collect data through a number of different local information systems. So we do not have one universal IT system which supports the delivery of health and social care um, across the many organisations across the whole of Berkshire which deliver those services. But what the shared care record does and does very well is act as a layer above the systems which organisations have in place independently. And that layer brings together information into a single place which can be seen by health and care professionals um, in the, to the benefit of delivering services more effectively. Um, there are multiple use cases um, and real world experiences which underline the importance of this. And um, most fundamentally, it removes the need for patients and residents to tell their story multiple times as they move between the different organisations which provide services to them. Um, however, we have also found through the deployment of this system over the years, many other um, experiences that our clinicians and our social care professionals have shared with us, which underline the importance of being able to do this. Um, put simply, it allows us to identify areas of risk for our population um, at the point in which they are seeing health and care professionals and for better decisions to be taken in the moment when clinical care and advice is being administered. Um, we do this in a very, very safe way. Um, the records are held um, securely um, and are stored in an, in an anonymized fashion when they're required to do so. There are really strict rules nationally around how data is used and shared between organizations. And we have a team of information governance professionals who work together to make sure those rules are adhered to. We regularly seek advice from national colleagues to ensure that we do this safely and within um, the parameters we are required to do it. Um, the benefit has been extraordinary over the years in which we've been implementing this. We continue to spread it and to scale it. Um, and we continue to see the benefit of that for our patients and residents. Um, next slide, please, Ollie. This gives you a bit of an idea um, on how the utilization of the shared care record has changed um, and how it is used by different organizations within our partnership. 
um, you'll see that some organizations use the shared care functionality more than others. Um, and if this graph went back to uh, the summer of 2016, when we first started to switch on elements of the shared care record, um, you'd see the bar down in the low hundreds. So over the five years in which we've been um, operating within and utilizing this in real world delivery, um, we're now up to over 50,000 in individual uses per month in uh, records being accessed by health and care professionals and delivery of care, which I think is absolutely extraordinary actually over um, the geography in which we serve. So um, it's really impressive to see it being used so broadly um, and we continue to work with organizations to ensure um, that it's deployed further and faster to the benefit of our residents. Next slide, please. Um, the, I won't dwell on this slide for a long time, but I think what it shows you is that we've accomplished an awful lot with the shared care record listed down the left hand side. A uh, number of new feeds and upgrades that we have rolled out over that period um, with direct access into uh, existing systems and new systems, such as the EPIC system, which was recently deployed at Frimley Health Foundation Trust. Um, and this also has been feeding into other transformation initiatives as well. Um, what the right hand side of this slide gives you some idea of is the fact that this is work that is almost never done and we're continuing to work on adding additional functionality um, and additional use cases which our professionals and our clinicians tell us are useful in the delivery of frontline care. Um, that's both prime in the primary delivery of care but also in the transformation of care as well. So um, there's lots of detail on that slide and if anyone wants to know more on any of these things then please let me know afterwards. Um, next one, please, Ollie. Um, what this also enables us to do, which is particularly exciting, is to explore very different models of how we deliver care um, to our residents. Um, remote management is probably the most real example of that we currently have in development. Um, we know that we need to help keep our patients well and provide ongoing clinical support to them in their normal care setting. So whether that's their home or a care home, or a residential space or otherwise. Um, and remote management gives us that capability to be able to do it. Um, you cannot do this without a high quality shared care record sat underneath to enable different care professionals to be able to see the information they are required to deliver the care they need to be able to do. Remote management takes this a step further. And we're looking at this currently in respiratory and diabetes, in heart failure and to our care homes population as well um, to ensure that using the digital systems um, that we are innovating with, that we can remotely monitor and manage people's conditions in their normal setting of care. Um, this is tremendously exciting um, and will enable us to deliver care in a fundamentally different way. Um, it builds on all the work that the shared care record team have delivered over the past five to six years um, and really represents the next frontier in the work which we are trying to do. Um, next slide please Ollie. Um, moving on to the resident facing digital world then um, and again this is really really important this is um, a, a key local focus for us but also forms part of the national focus as well on ensuring that um, residents actually can access the information which we store about them and that we use digital tools to help signpost them um, to the best possible care which they can receive. Um, we are confident that if we do this well, it means that residents receive better care in the first instance, um, but also ensures that residents don't go to the wrong part of our system where they may have to wait longer for treatment um, or not receive the treatment they need in the first instance. There are some examples moving from left to right across this slide, which, which I think underlines some of the use cases for this. So waiting well, for example, patients who are on a waiting list for a planned care procedure, we can use some of our technology to help si signpost them for both self-help resources um, and also for other resources in the third sector and voluntary sector, which we know can provide support and help them to wait better um, before they have their procedure and to ensure their procedure can go ahead at all. And um, we've also got a new resident portal, which is almost ready to launch um, and enables people to log on and themselves and undertake their own assessments of their health and well-being with recommendations which are presented back to residents and patients 
uh, for things that they can do to keep themselves better and more well um, without having to access the health service in a more reactive sense. Um, we're really keen to start working with our local authority and third sector colleagues to understand how we can use this and deploy it most effectively for people to access. Um, the same is true of complementary apps. Uh, we've been developing a number of those locally. Um, MSK, maternity are two examples of this, but there are others um, to ensure that patients can see the information they need to see. Um, on the maternity one, I think people will be familiar with the frustration of having to carry around the red book or the yellow book or whatever color book it is in the system in which they're accessing care, um, whilst pieces of paper fall out and unleaf themselves each time you go into an appointment on the antenatal or postnatal pathway. Digitizing that into an app-based experience will be significantly better for our residents. Um, and this is all underpinned by high quality um, communications and engagement and the work that we have to do around digital inclusion and planning for people for whom digital is not a primary mode of accessing um, care or support or other services in their day-to-day -day lives. And I'll speak a bit more about that later on. Next slide, please, Ollie. Moving on to the third leg of this stool then, which is on um, primary care transformation. Um, this is a huge area of focus for us. Um, we know that uh, activity in primary care is significantly up. Um, over the last three years, we see 15% more activity in primary care than we saw prior to the pandemic. Um, and we also know that um, workforce in primary care um, is becoming ever more scarce as well. Digital is the way in which we can mitigate some of this risk and provide a fundamentally better experience to our patients who need to access primary care support and advice. Um, we're working on a number of different access points using technology to underpin um, an improvement in access for patients to primary care. So the usage of advanced telephony and voice over IP, uh, plus uh, e-consoles and other digital front doors will enable our patients to actually get the advice they need more quickly without necessarily having to get an appointment and attend inside their local practice or surgery. And this is, a, again, such an important um, strand of our digital transformation, which we're focusing on right now. I can move to the fourth section, Ollie. Um, go past this one, please. Thank you. Um, and finally, I just wanted to say a few things around our connected care analytics platform. So one of the secondary benefits of having access to this high quality data and working within a data rich environment is our ability to plan improved transformations for our patients. Um, so there's a, a whole summary of things on this slide and I won't go into each of them individually. Again, happy to take questions on any of them if people are interested. But for example, being able to segment our resident population into areas of risk so that we know who our highest risk patients are, gives us a huge opportunity to fundamentally change that we offer care to those individuals so that we're managing the people who are most likely um, to require urgent or emergency care in the first instance. Um, this really represents a shift to us for the, in the NHS side of the world, um, moving away from a reactive model of care, which has essentially been the way the NHS has done business since the 1940s, to a more proactive, methodology of identifying patients who are most at risk and putting in place mitigations for those risks early and now so that they receive the care they need rather than tipping in to the NHS in a way which is more reactive. Um, we are really confident this will provide a better set of outcomes and experiences for our residents, uh, but we're really only on the cusp of working out how to adapt the model of care which we provide to take the best advantage um, of that opportunity. Um, there are other things on this list which I could pull out and talk for a very long time on. I'm not going to, um, but I think they're all fascinating and really important for us. And again, happy to come back to them if that's helpful. Ollie, can we keep going? Um, and finally, I just wanted to note that we're actually also now changing um, the way we set ourselves up on the digital and analytics side as well um, by creating additional capacity aligned to each place, recognizing that our five place model gives us new opportunities for using analytics locally as well, working with colleagues in primary care, in local government and in the third sector um, to help design and deliver new ways of delivering care to our residents. And I just wanted to share this to show that this is a real joint effort between our system-wide work, which we actually do across multiple systems, um, 
facing into the other part of Berkshire as well, and our much more local delivery work that we do um, at a place and primary care network level two. Um, that's the last slide in the deck. Before I hand over um, back to you, Priya, to take questions from board members, I did just want to pull out a couple more things really quickly as well through voiceover. So um, firstly, digital exclusion is a really important topic for us, and we are doing significant work in this space. Um, it became really apparent during the early days of the COVID pandemic in the first wave that we had to be super mindful of the people who live in our system who cannot access um, digital fluently in the way that other parts of our population possibly can. Um, we have done an awful lot on this, working with our provider colleagues, working through checklists and flags um, on our connected care database so that we can identify those patients who are potentially at risk of digital exclusion. Um, there is more work we have to do in this space as well, but it is heavily on our radar. Um, secondly, on language and culture, we really have an awful lot more to do here as well. I was in a national conversation this morning around the work we want to do on remote management for heart failure. Um, actually, the importance of being able to deploy a remote management um, solution into place into um, a population where we have more than 15 different languages being spoken, even within a single place, is critical that we get that right so that we are not generating new inequities or inequalities um, in the service or quality of care that we provide. Um, again, the team is right across this, but there is more work that we need to do. Thirdly, I wanted to flag that actually this also means that a number of our clinical roles will change over the years to come. If we are moving into new ways of delivering services underpinned by digital and data technology, then there are opportunities for exploring new workforce models, both in health and social care. And that's something which we have to be really joined up and alive to the opportunities in that space. Um, and then fourth and finally, the importance of engaging with our population on this. Um, this is not something which we can just do onto people. This is something which we need to be hearing from our population around whether it works for them and how we can do it better. We are learning and at the start of our journey in this space, but I hope that you all agree with me that the opportunity we've got in front of us is one which is tremendously exciting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Really helpful summary there. Thank you. Now, um, may I open it up for comment and question from our board members? Let's start with Fiona. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, to uh, Sam's last points that as a system and with our uh, provider partners and social care partners, we really do have to see um, the digital work as a key transformation tool for service delivery and therefore workforce models and a real part of the solution to the major workforce gaps we've got, both in social care, as evidenced by the report published last week, um, and also uh, we're all facing inside the NHS. So um, the bedrock for Frimley is, is our understanding of that as a system. The epic deployment in Frimley Health Foundation Trust is a massive uh, plank of their transformation agenda. So I think that's the key message and, and the work we need to do with our uh, residents and uh, populations on really understanding both the value of different modes of delivery and the value and safety aspects of shared care records. So that's it for me. Thank you, Fiona. Let's bring in Safina and then Prash, please. Thank you, Priya. Um, thanks, Sam. That was really, really uh, helpful. And I think you answered a lot of my questions in your extra additional points. So thank you for that. I think just a couple of reflections. Um, that digital digital exclusion is is key, isn't it? Like you said, um, there's something about that literacy around digital, but also that poverty, digital poverty. So I think for something that we need to think about. So if, it, if we're ex expecting um, residents, patients to use um, digital kind of platforms, there's something about literacy and um, poverty, and so how can we res respond to that? So making sure that 
communities that are, you know are kind of uh, can respond to our, our 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 needs as well and there's something around that kind of health inequalities framework around protection prevention and promotion and how do we use a digital platform to get them key messages around promotion health promotion um and things like protection and you know screening and things like that so i think that'll be another way we can really build our digital framework around that kind of to help them in health inequalities thank you Perhaps. Yeah, thank you very much, Sam. Obviously, you know, I'm a big, big fan. Ringing endorsements, the way you brought that together is very nice. Uh, Safina, thank you for just, yeah, covering off the, um, the inequalities piece. I think all I wanted to reflect on was, I know you mentioned the maternity care record, but for me, that was, as a junior doctor, to see uh, records in the hands of a patient physically, so it belonged to them, was one aspect. Uh, and that's really important. So I feel that even though we're moving to the digital space, putting those records into the patient's hands is, is going to unlock them, mm -hmm. as it did for my maternity patients. And then the ability to write notes, but to see entries from other professionals and colleagues was powerful. So I love the idea that that is electronic. Uh, the, the analytics, I mean, I've always felt that our ability to collect data in the system since the days of the Thames Valley Digital Warehouse and onwards. So I feel as though we've always been at the forefront of it. But the fact that we now have this live analytics team, certainly from a primary care point of view, that's remarkable. Not having to work off data that might be nine to 10 months old from Public Health England, but actually to work off data that's 24 hours old is remarkable. And the ability to pivot is superb. But really for me, from a pure general practice point of view, it's the idea that if we can get the communications right, if we can try and understand that there is a flexibility, obviously there are patients that are going to need face-to-face, -to -face, there are patients that are going to need uh, laying, on, laying on of hands, but it's that silent majority, the patients that tell me how much the ability to do an online consultation, to be able to connect through texting and video conferencing, that allows them not to have to take time off work or to be able to connect with me while they're in London, that's powerful. And, and I'm hoping we can try and sort of capture that because I think I don't want that to get drowned out um, by that sort of call for access because I think I've heard that piece that that is going to, you know, that will revolutionise how we work with a dwindling workforce. So it's that sort of ring endorsement. And then the final piece was really that excitement around where we can push further faster. Obviously, uh, like Lalitha, the, 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 the O2 saturation projects that a lot of our provision dealt with was a game changer during the COVID pandemic. You know, we were delivering saturation monitors, we were working with our partners, and we were absolutely saving lives uh, by using that virtual space, by keeping patients at home, and, and the way we're going to move into uh, that space over the next six months is definitely key if we're gonna unlock this uh, UEC situation. So for me, uh, digital is a space to get very excited about because we have legacy and we absolutely have ambition. So thanks Sam for presenting that ringing endorsement. Thank you very much, Rush. And over to you, Ilona. Thank you. Um, so like Safina and, and Prash, really great to see those examples of fantastic progress over the last few years. Um, I, I had a question really, because given we've made some good progress, what, what, of our, what lessons have we learned? Because this stuff is quite hard usually. Um, it takes funding, it takes commitment, it takes knocking heads together in ways that we might not normally knock them together. Um, so just interested to get any reflections on, on what we've learned and how we'll use that learning as we, as we move forward. And then my second point was really just you whetted my appetite. So I, I want to get a clearer sense of um, kind of are we where we expect to be, where do we want to be next? How are we going to kind of track and drive that progress forward and make sure it, it's the sort of digital enabling part of our plans um, do everything they can to support our, our strate strategic ambitions around tackling health inequalities. Um, but great to see all those, uh, the, all the progress that's been made. Thanks. Thank you. And um, should we bring you back in now, Sam? Yeah, thanks Priya. Um, so just a, a few points in reflection on the question. So, I mean, Safina, you know how much I agree with you on, on the points that you raised, uh, and they're such important points for all of us. I think uh, we need to change our focus on this from a different mindset than one we had during the pandemic. So I think at the start of the pandemic, when we started to move 
many more services into a, a digital first model, um, we took a bit of a view that we had to make sure that we could provide something of equivalence to those who couldn't access the digital services. Um, I don't think that methodology is going to hold for us for much longer um, because the risk is that these new ways of delivering things, particularly around remote monitoring, for example, is a really good illustration of this. Um, you will, we will generate inequalities if we don't now do this properly. Um, so rather than it being around equivalence, it's actually around how do we adapt the offer within a single offer to make sure that we can reach all parts of the population who would benefit from it. And that may require investment in upskilling the people who will actually be um, offered the support and the different services that we're trying to offer and th and that will be an investment really well made so it requires i think a, just a different mindset going forward from here um, i'm grateful to keep discussing this with you anyway because we'll pick it up in in other forums um around crash really welcome your comments and echo them thank you really grateful for them um and i, I think again we're in um, very very strong agreement around all of that and then uh, Ilona, around learning. I think, I mean, I'm to a large extent, I'm still learning around this as well. So, um, and trying to synthesize uh, the learning of the last few years in this area. So uh, there are some really, really key points to pull out on this. So um, one is that in many ways, we're limited only by our imagination in, in what we can do in this space. So giving people permission to really vision what we could do with the range of tools and capabilities that we're developing is critical because um, we're coming up with new ways and how we can use this all the time. And we don't want to dampen that innovation, which I think our workforce has in spades. So we need to make sure that we give them that voice and the ability to translate that into what could be better if we use these things to the full capabilities and the range um, that that gives us. Um, there is some really important stuff around, uh, and you'll have heard this in multiple other forums, we all have over the years, um, getting the tech right is the easy part in many ways. So developing the digital capability and the platform architecture and the data architecture, um, I think we've demonstrated we can do. Changing the way we deliver the services to take full, uh, take the full advantage of the things that we can do to improve the lives of our residents and patients is actually the much harder bit because it requires developing a new consensus, a new delivery model, sometimes investment, um, and bringing people with you along that journey. Um, and that's the hard bit that takes time and you have to invest even more in the delivery of the transformation than you invest into the, the development of the capability itself. So um, I think that's the real takeaway for me and that I'd want others on the board to hear. There will be other lessons I'm sure that um, if colleagues from the digital team were here, would be very grateful to share. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, that has been really helpful. And we're going to move now to our the second of our strategic updates. And I think it plays absolutely into the points Ilona and Sam have made. So moving from our digital and analytics infrastructure to the whole system architecture that makes working together easy and obvious. So um, Sam and Emma, over to you for the update on the ICP journey. Thank you. Thanks, Priya. So a um, bit of a double act this. I'm going to kick us off uh, into the first few slides, then I'm going to hand over to Emma, who's going to take us home. So um, really quick update on the ICP. We discussed this at our last meeting, which was um, which took place before, I think, the first ICP session. Um, and Ollie, if you just um, skip us through to the next slide, then we can give you an update on where we are with this. So you'll have seen this graphic before. It is our system architecture, which is still emerging um, and tries to capture the ways in which we are working together um, across new constructs and new ways of um, working across organizations. Um, what we're focusing on today is the green bit at the top, the Frimley Integrated Care Partnership. And of course, we're sat in the blue circle um, to the right, the Integrated Care Board. So um, that's where our focus is for this discussion. Next slide, please, Ollie. Um, and a reminder um, on what the ICP is. Uh, it is a statutory joint committee. It's established in law in the Health and Care Act um, from earlier this year, which um, came into force on the 1st of July. Um, and the role of the ICP is to bring our whole partnership together um, to create a focus on our long-term strategy and to create a forum 
where we can look at the wider determinants of health. So, um, and just a reminder um, by that phrase, I mean the things which we <laughs> unscientifically estimate to account for 90% of people's health outcomes. So housing, uh, employment, skills, education, training, um, and all the other things um, around that space, which um, uh, the people, the organizations on this slide take responsibility for collectively. The next slide, please, Ollie. So as I mentioned, the Health and Care Act came into force on the 1st of July. Um, and since uh, prior to that and then beyond, we've been working to establish those four component parts of the architecture, which we showed you on slide one. Um, as a system partnership, we've been working for the best part of a year to develop the Frimley ICP. And we've held a number of design group sessions during that time with representatives from right across the public sector. Um, including our clinical and professional leaders as well. During the summer of this year, in anticipation of launching the ICP, um, the ICB chair, Priya, um, met with a number of our local leaders to help prepare for that first session. Um, those leaders included elected members, primarily health and wellbeing board chairs of our five upper tier local authorities, which have got health and wellbeing boards. Um, delighted to say that we held our first ICP <laughs> on the 29th of September. Um, we held it as a development session for ICP members um, in order to consider how the ICP was going to work um, and to discharge its strategic remit and work most effectively together. Um, I think we had around 45 um, attendees at our first session, which we were delighted with, and a really genuine cross-section of our partnership, ranging from local authorities to the third sector, charities, elected members, um, NHS bodies as well. It really was very exciting to see that range of professionals um, in one place um, discussing this task that's in front of us. Um, we looked at the three core components um, of the ICP, um, which are around setting the long-term strategic direction of our ICS, um, safeguarding our vision and values as a partnership, and also creating that time and space to consider the wider determinants of health and it was a really positive discussion um, as well. The ICP will come back again and meet in November to continue its work together and um, most notably the production of a refreshed ICS strategy by December 2022 um, which is feeling ever closer uh, <laughs> and is not far away. Um, uh, a plan for the session in November, um, Emma's going to take you through that in a moment. So if we can go on to the next slide please Ollie and I'll hand over to you Emma. Thank you, Sam. And I won't dwell too long on this slide as Sam's um, alluded to some of these elements already. Here are just a couple of pictures of the um, inaugural ICP meeting that we had in September. And as Sam said, a really interesting and thriving session where we spent quite a bit of time with our partners across our system, thinking about what does it mean to work together in this new space? How do we use our system leadership skills, our partnerships and our connections to really understand our residents and our communities and the challenges they face differently? And also really importantly, how do we use this opportunity to give voice to our residents and, and particularly to those for whom we may not hear from so easy and naturally and to think about how we work together to use our assets and, and our activities and the things we do to make a difference to the people we're here to serve. Um, if we move on to the next slide, please. So as Sam already alluded to, the sort of time um, clock seems to be ticking quite quickly. Our, our working principle is that our integrated care partnership assembly um, is inclusive. Um, it therefore, it actually has around, I think we now counted about 80 partner members, Sam, if, if we had everybody around the table. So really sort of inclusive and going down the more is more as we begin our work together. Um, and we would like to be meeting with our assembly on a quarterly basis. We do have our ICS strategy refresh piece of work to do, which means that we will be meet, meeting in much shorter order after September and coming together in November to do that really important piece of work around refreshing and developing our interim strategy ahead of the December submission, but really recognising that that's the beginning of our journey together as an assembly and it sets the framework for not only how do we want to work together, but the sorts of things that we do and we, we prioritise together. So next slide, please. Um, so as we come towards November, as you say, Sam, we set up two core 
um, groups to work together. So we've got a group of colleagues from across the system who are going to help us co-design the November session. And Karen and, and you, and you particularly are on the call here today, so you may want to come in and offer some reflections. Um, we'll be working together on, on how best we get um, the use our time together in November. And also we've got an internal working group to ensure that as we come together to refresh our strategy is we think about the fact we have a five-year strategy and I think we're in year four now of our creating healthier community strategy and um, how do we use that as a as a bedrock given the significant engagement um, we have through our through those who remember our inspiration station approach to review reflect and say well what what feels the same now what do we still need to focus on and actually what feels really really different um, given that we've had a COVID pandemic and the challenges the cost of living and and the things that people already alluded to. So how do we ensure that the work we do together can tackle those challenges? Next slide, please. So what we'd like to do is to come together with our Integrated Care Partnership Assembly um, and think about our two overarching objectives about creating healthy communities and reducing inequalities. Um, do they still stand the test of time? To think about whether our six strategic ambitions need to be strengthened. Are they still right? Is there something else that we've missed that's really significant? Um, and, and how do we want to work together to, to deliver the objectives within all of those ambitions? Next slide, please. So as you say, we have an emerging plan for our time together in November. And, and I know Sam and myself and Priya and Fiona and Karen here on the call feel a huge responsibility for ensuring that anything we do together with all of the system partners is really meaningful, given that's a lot of people in, in the room at, at one time. So we do have a small co-design group. Um, and what we're thinking about is what's the inputs we need to give to our assembly members before we come together in November? What can we share with them beforehand? How can we give them a flavour of the strategy? Um, and how do we use our time to inform each other about our residents, but in particular, have a really interactive and engaging session on our ambitions? So we're thinking about sort of ambition stations and how we test our key priorities, our objectives, and the ways we want to work with people in a really interactive session, and then work to bring that together into our first draft submission for December. So I'm going to pause there. I don't know if you want to take the slides down, Ollie, and Sam and I'd be happy to take any questions or reflections. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Sam. Um, any comments or questions, please? I know that... Okay, thank you. That's been really clear and very helpful and we're looking forward to, to um, being involved collectively in next stages. And um, we have next on the agenda an update on our emergency preparedness, resilience and response um, documentation and this I'm handing over to Fiona for. Um, just to put into context, um, Frimley is a category one responder um, under the Civil Contingencies Act and the Health and Care Act. And uh, these plans enable an effective response to a major incident or emergency, mitigating this, the effects of those and ensuring that critical services are maintained. Um, so thank you, Fiona. Yeah, it's, um, thank you. Um, it's really, the, it's just to approve the changes which recognise that we've moved from being a lower level category to a first level category responder as, as a result of the legislative strain changes and our establishment as an integrated care board. So um, it's it's a technical exercise, but really important in terms of integrated care board oversight, especially um, if we have to move into either a local uh, critical incident level or, uh, or major incident level or even nationally, which we did in the past through the pandemic. So uh, just to be clear, um, uh, seeking the board's approval for the policy and framework we've published. Thank you, Fiona. And I'm seeing yeses around the screens. Thank you very much. And um, Ilona, please. Um, it, it's a yes. It was just for, for noting um, that this was previously considered at the audit committee in September. The cover paper doesn't say it went through that governance route, but it did. And we were happy for its onward transmission here. The one thing I sought assurance on as audit chair was just the prior engagement it had. 
um, before reaching us as, as the audit committee and I was I was content with with where the, the kind of engagement that had gone on beforehand but I thought just worth noting that because the cover paper seemed to have missed that I don't know whether it needed to go through both to be honest but it, it has <laughs> so <laughs> worth noting thank you well that's good assurance thank you very much Ilona um, so now let's move to the uh, performance oversight report and um, with Richard Chapman to start. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Chair. I think uh, Ollie may have a slide to share on screen. Uh, that's the one. Thank you, Ollie. Um, so I'm just going to cover the uh, operational and financial performance. Sarah will talk to quality and uh, Caroline to workforce. Um, so the key operational performance um, points to note are the continuing really high demand pressures across the whole of the system. Um, the, the patient flow through hospitals is a key challenge. And despite the fact that uh, Frimley Healthcare has had uh, its escalation capacity open throughout the whole of the year, bed occupancy rates have remained uh, stubbornly above um, in, the, in the high 90s um, of, of percents throughout the whole of the year. That um, patient flow challenge and that bed occupancy challenge in particular as a result of patient flow is leading to deterioration in performance within A&E. Uh, it leads to increased numbers of ambulance handover delays and to uh, patients staying within the emergency department for more than 12 hours. We have, in response, produced urgent emergency care plans for winter on behalf of the system uh, or, or in conjunction with the system, and work continues across the system to implement those plans and to begin the implementation of the system-wide urgent emergency care strategy, which has been under development for some time and is now, is now reaching a conclusion. Uh, a result of that demand pressure within the system alongside um, inflationary pressures in the economy as a whole uh, is that the financial position has fallen behind plan by 13.6 million for the two um, statutory organisations within the Frimley ICS, that's uh, Frimley Healthcare and Frimley Integrated Care Board by 13.6 million um, for, for the year. We uh, have planning assumptions which require the delivery of material efficiency through the second half of the year to deliver a break-even plan for the system, but that is going to be extremely challenging given the maintenance of that uh, extremely high demand um, coming into the system and the patient flow issues as described. I'm just going to hand over now to, uh, to Sarah for uh, the quality aspects, and then Sarah, if you'd be kind enough to hand on to Caroline for workforce, then that would be appreciated. Thanks, Rich. And obviously it goes, although we haven't highlighted from a quality perspective, that patient flow and the impact, obviously that, that does have an impact on the quality of care we're delivering. Having said that, there is um, across all parts of the system mitigation in place to try and limit uh, the risks associated with that um, really uh, and, and working with things like harm reviews to try and identify if there is any harm happening. Um, so that just wanted to say that because it would I didn't want people to think we weren't thinking that that was a, an issue from a quality perspective. I think the two things I wanted to highlight, which are probably quite key things that people will be thinking about um, nationally, is following that horrific, and I can only say horrific, panorama programme a few weeks ago in relation to inpatient mental health services provided by the NHS. We've... Um, all organisations in the ICP have received uh, a letter from Claire Meredith, the national director, asking for a series of actions for, to be taken and the, and the providers are taking those actions. In addition to that, we're standing back and looking at actually could this happen here um, and what do we need to do to really try and think about how we can um, be be more assured that it isn't happening here. So that lots of work is going on in that domain, including thinking about what mechanisms do we have that really give um, that outside look in, because obviously all of our organisations do walk arounds, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we want to really utilise those, those, those eyes, such as st medical students, student nurses, et cetera, to see what we can do differently. And so that's a piece of work that will be done across the system 
they'll be going to individual provider boards and then we'll bring it together uh, from a point of view to our integrated quality um, and performance meeting and, and then for eating up to here. Um, and then the other thing really is um, thinking about Ockerton, the other big thing around maternity services. Um, there's been an, a peer review across the region looking at um, maternity services. We're waiting the outcome of that peer review. And um, we are um, also looking at the 10 questions where there is only one amber rating which we have to achieve by December. So I think that's really the kind of two main things I wanted to highlight. Thank you. Hand over to Caroline. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Rich. Um, just a couple of things I'd want to highlight. The very short statement at the end of this slide uh, could be written about all of our sectors um, across the system um, from through health and social care. So increasing concerns about um, uh, uh, retaining and recruiting staff. Um, you'll have seen in the national press last week, uh, Skills for Care describing the position of social care in particular. One area though that um, whilst the data shows us increasing use of temporary staff, um, uh, particularly um, in NHS organisations, our provider trusts working in collaboration with uh, now nine trusts are um, achieving uh, improvements, significant improvements in terms of the cost and use of temporary staff, uh, uh, particularly within NHS settings. So as a result of that collaboration, we're seeing uh, reduced uh, use of some agencies, um, a holding firm between uh, NHS trusts on rates of pay uh, with agency providers in particular. Um, so uh, whilst increased usage of agency staff, we are seeing better and uh, a significant benefit as a result of NHS trusts in particular working together uh, to uh, better deploy uh, agency staff and, in effect, uh, better manage the market uh, providers uh, around that sector. But the overall message around uh, recruitment and retention still being difficult, uh, collaborative working, uh, enabling improvement and uh, continued focus on the here and now in terms of making jobs attractive to uh, all of the communities that we serve. Thanks. Thank you very much, all three. Um, any comments and questions from the board, please? Graham and then Safina. Thanks, Bria. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on the Panorama programme uh, and, and say how sad and distressing it was to watch that. But also to note there was also a dispatches programme a week later that also highlighted some of the issues with closed cultures. Uh, and obviously the week after there was also another panorama about the support of disabled people, people with autism and learning disability yet. So um, I think there are a whole series of issues and I think they all have a common thread around closed cultures and really hearing the voice of people who use our services and families and carers. And I just wanted to say in addition uh, to what Sarah had mentioned, we were also thinking about the role of peer support workers in uh, promoting an open culture and services. So I think that's a, another aspect that we can follow up that we, we certainly should do, um, because I think those open cultures will be crucial about uh, never have to see situations like that again. Thank you, Graham. And Safina? Thanks, Priya. M mine was to do with the um the uh, panorama as well, Sarah. I don't know if there's an opportunity to focus on the kind of freedom to speak up bit around that as well. So when people are speaking up, or if they're not speaking up, why aren't they? So I don't know whether within that work we can build that kind of how important it is to to speak up when people are seeing things, because um, clearly people were noticing things and people don't speak up for whatever reason. So I think there's an opportunity there for us to to think about that as well. Thank you, Selena. Did you want to come back in, Sarah?
I think you're still on mute. So. Uh, I don't oh, know why it wasn't working. I was clicking away, but it wasn't unmuted. And I think, Safina, Graham, everyone, I think that's exactly right. They're the things that we'll be considering it with, you know, and that and that is about bringing things together and really having that conversation around what is going to make the difference and not doing it in a in a in a in a reactive way but in a really thoughtful way and that's where the beauty when you have multiple pro providers of these services in in the system and plus overlapping two other systems we can really learn from each other and make sure that we we take the best from all of it so absolutely to all of that thank you fiona yeah, I just wanted to stress really the um, theme of speaking up. So Safina is um, the integrated care boards and, uh, uh, and if you like the system speak up guardian. And so I, I do think we need to, in terms of our duty of care to our residents and patients, um, remember that the importance we attach to culture and leadership that allows people to say what is difficult to say um, in their day-to-day -day experience, whether it be um, experience observing poor care or being uh, bullied or harassed. So, um, and also that bullying and harassment doesn't isn't just internal to organisations, but can be from the public as well. So, um, I think uh, I think we're in a really good position as a system to support that thoughtful work that says starts with the position it could happen here anytime and it's safe to own that and describe it and then share if you like an account to the public about how we're trying to enable that culture of transparency but also kindness to each other in sharing really difficult experience so it doesn't have to lead to people speaking up to the cqc or to the media because they've they, they don't feel we they feel you're in a closed uh, setup so i um i just would commend to the board to really think about our strategy as expressed in the integrated care partnership work and the importance of that leadership and culture strand thank you and thank you everybody um for the papers the issues that we've covered this afternoon um, and for all of the discussion, thank you. Um, we haven't received any questions this time from the public and um, may I ask then whether anyone has any other business? I'm seeing shapes of the head. So thank you everyone again. Um, really good to have had our strategic um, updates and these um, elements of uh, our current performance. And so thanks to everybody. Our next meeting in public will be on the 20th of December and the website will have more details. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.